Hello, it's Summer Peter the Fist of Dawn here with another reading. As you can tell from the title, it is going to be Cadian Blood. An old book, some would say. A paperback for me, since that's where most of my books come from. This one is an Imperial Guard novel by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Well, without further ado, let's begin with the reading, shall we? Starting with an epilogue of sorts. I'm having absolutely no fun today. Derek hissed, pulling out a chunk of shrapnel from his thigh. He looked up from where he lay. His men, those that still lived, were rousing. Too experienced to rise fully and face enemy fire. They crawled through a shredded furniture, finding cover wherever they could. Lazfire was already flashing at them from the Catherine positions across the camber chamber. This is Alliance, Captain, Denrick reached out, bleeding fingers to pull his fallen lasgun closer. He'd carried that weapon since he'd been on White Shield over twenty years ago. Not a chance in hell he'd leave it here, no matter how battered it was. His fingertips snapped, snagged the strap, and he dragged it. The rifle bore a plasti of fresh burns and new scratches, but otherwise looked fine. He guessed it would still fire. Alliance broken, he repeated. Acknowledged, Kawa. Inbound. Hold the name of the Emperor. Was thick its court reply before getting the link. Easier said than done, thought out Derek. It is the 41st millennium. For more than a hundred centuries, the Emperor sat immobile on the golden throne of Earth. He is a master of mankind, by the will of the gods, and master of millions of worlds. By the might of his inexhaustible armies, he is a rotting carcass, writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is a carrion lord of the Imperium, for whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day, so that he may never truly die. Yet. In his deathless state, the Emperor continues his eternal vigilance. Mighty battle fleets across the demon-infested miasma of the warp, the only route between distant stars, their way lit by the Astronomicon, the psychic manifestation of the Emperor's will. Vast armies give battle in his name on uncounted worlds. Graced among his soldiers are the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines. Bioengineered super warriors, their comrades in arms are Legion, the Imperial Guard, and countless planetary defense forces, or PDF, the ever vigilant Inquisition, and the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus, to name only a few. But for all their multitudes, they are barely enough to hold off the ever present threat from aliens, heretics, and mutants, or worse. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of technology and science, for so much has been forgotten, never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future, there is only war. There is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of carnage, slaughter, and the laughter of thirsting gods. Prologue. The way the world dies. At first, there was silence. People died. But there was no outcry. The bodies rested in noiseless repose, in tower habitation, spires. In the prayer rooms of great monasteries and gutters by the sides of streets, the deaths went unnoticed. This was a world that saw ten million new pilgrims each month. It was no stranger to off-worlders making planetfall, only to die soon after. The shrine world of Kutha, named for the saint himself, was a beacon of faith and hope for the people of Sodia Secta. Faith flared or withered for those who came to tread the holy soil of this blessed world, seeking affirmation for lives lived without meaning. 
Hope flowered or died for those who landed here, seeking to torch the relics of a long-dead saint and to be healed of energy or illnesses. When people began to die, there was no planet-wide panic, no ringing sirens wailing across cities and no distress calls to nearby worlds crying of a devastating disease. The sickness spread, tearing through the population. But to those who watched for such things, there was a spike in the numbers. These things happened from time to time. A plague brought from off-world, and the world's leaders said, Faith must scourge the taint from the righteous and pure. No warnings, no panic. Silence. The silence did not last long. At dawn of the outbreak's second week, there are too many dead for the funeral priests to haul into the consecrated incinerators. And the ecclesiarchy governors realized their planet was suffering no natural plague. The death toll was catastrophic. And the Catherine Catherineite acolytes, traditionally tasked with the funerary rites, walked the streets in gangs, losing the battle to do their simple duty. The initial atmospheric cries for help reached out from Kutha. Several hundred psychers worldwide screamed their pleas into the warp, begging for assistance. Imperial forces in the sector responded to the cries for aid in an impressive time. Scarus was forever an alchemy's ripest target and the Emperor's servants never released their vigilance here. Fleets of ships powered up their engines and broke into the warp, chasing the source of psychic screams like bloodhounds pursuing the scent of prey. The stream of calm channel messages and psychic transmissions from Kauther told of a plague without end, of millions already dead and a planet dying. The Imperium was no stranger to the cause of unbelief. Even now, the plague wrecked dozens of worlds across Sigmentum Obscurus, but Kautha was an anomaly. The one world that broke the pattern of infestation and other infected worlds stood on the rim of the webmaster's black crusade. Kautha, however, was far from the great eye, and the systems drowning in the tides of battle. All this death made no sense. There was no spaceship of arch enemy to spread the taint, no touch of heresy detected among the populace, and no sign of chaos in the planet's rule. But it was a curse. The curse of unbelief riped across the shrine world now, taking those who lacked true faith in the god emperor, yet rotted flesh and turned organs putrescent, while the victims still lived. Many turned to suicide rather than decay in agony. Riots broke out over the planet. Funeral pyres burned endlessly in streams of black smoke, choking the sky around the target cathedral cities, the largest cathedral cities. The Adeptus Hierarchs, receiving the first wave of communications from Kautha, ordered the planet cut off from the Imperium. At the first signs of the curse of unbelief, assembled in the heavens above the doomed world, a mighty fleet coalesced over the course of several days. They did not come to save the people. They came only to stop the population evacuating. The taint. The fleet captains knew. It must never spread. On the command decks of the Imperial Navy vessels, stationed in high orbit, stern-faced inquisitors oversaw the blockade's management. No vaccine had ever been found to ease the suffering of the affiliated in the words of the Inquisitor Cassius, as he stood on the bridge of the Gothic-class vessel in his name, We consign these souls to oblivion, for mercy now would damn us all. The blockade of Imperial Navy vessels hung in the reaches above Kauther, enforcing the quarantine with lethal vigor. Thousands of the Emperor citizens died under the anger of the Imperial guns as the blockade vessels fired on any ship fleeing the planet. It wasn't long before the attempt ceased. The people on the surface were either too ill to make the journey, or already dead. Bizarrely, pilgrims sought to make planetfall, still wishing to walk among the cathedral cities of the saint's world and receive a blessing of St. Cowther. 
and the attempts by pilgrim vessels to reach the surface were deterred by stern threats and the weapons batteries of Cobra-class destroyers. Such warnings, a bare-faced presentation of the Emperor's might, were enough for most ships. The single vessel had been filled with souls pious enough to run the blockade. This ship, a wallowing barge little more than a cargo hauler, and packed with three hundred pilgrims, ultimately did make it down to the surface of Kelther. What remained of the ship after its belief encounter with Imperial Fury fighters flame through the atmosphere and crashed into the Western Ocean. Inquisitor Bastin Kaz of the Ordo Septimterium stayed in Vox contact with the Enforcer Marshal of Kelther, a man by the name of Benedict Benedict, until the very end of the Imperial control. The commander of the planet's enforcers remained in touch with the Inquisitor for seventeen days, describing the scenes of carnage and plague ravaging the surface as his men tried to retain order. Every word was recorded, each syllable of his rhythmic cant, distorted as it was by Vox interference. Though this crackling monotone Cassius learned of the erosion and breakdown of imperial rule, on the third day of contact, the marshal reported cults rising among the dwindling Kowther planetary defense force, and cultists within being spared the curse's death. The dictate in Piriaris was broken, the emperor's law abandoned. By this time, the global law enforced enforcement force was already effectively destroyed. It fell to the elite forces to take to the streets slaughtering cultists in the series of brutal raids on hidden strongholds. Despite initial success, they were doomed to fail. On the sixth day, canting rose from the temples across the planet, no longer in praise of the Emperor, but now pleading to the ruinous powers for mercy. Control across the planet was under threat, and the capital city of Solithane standing out as a final bastion of Imperial order. The enforcers entered the cathedral districts of Southrain, in an unprecedented force, leading the shattered remains of still loyal PDF and the still living law enforcement officers. Their objective was to quell the rising cultists across the planet in a decisive and damning half week of fighting. Benicek reported losses among his forces of the ninety three per cent on the morning of the ninth day. The cult members their numbers were far greater than had been initially surmised. Those that were not already well armed by PDF defectors overcame enforcer assault teams by sheer weight of numbers. The marshal produced evidence in both audio and picked form of his men dragged down and eaten by plague victims in some districts of falling under fire from hordes of cultists and others. Carius looked the other gray, blurry picks beamed up from the surface by Benicek. Here an enforcer's team, repressor tank flamed in the street. There a horde of plague victims surrounded by monstrously filled with dying citizens. Too many of the dead had not been destroyed, and still living populations were playing for the future, for the failure of the funeral priesthood now. On the eleventh day, reports became increasingly choppy and erratic. The swelling cults claimed whole districts of dying cities, each member saved from death by the new alliance. Chaos and magnations writhed the planet, eroding all reliability and astropathic contact, and panning all psychically gifted souls aboard the blockade fleet vessels. The ship's navigators and all present inquisitors had a lifetime of training to resist such invasive psychic agony but they still suffered. The touch of chaos affected many of those without psychic talents. Incidents of homicide and apostasy broke out aboard the destroyer vessel. These were quickly crushed by Inquisitor-led purges. Through the Cobra destroyer, Terra Spite was lost when the unrest within the ship's bowels led to explosions. Three hundred souls lost, and the wreckage rained on the cathedral cities below or a storm of fire from the heavens. The Inquisitors ordered the blockade into higher orbit 
after the shipboard purges were complete. Kalitha was now an holy beacon within the warp, and proximity to the foulness sweeping the planet was deemed a mortal taint threat to the naval crews. Small clusters of the destroyers orbited the planet in shifts, then broke away to allow others their turn. No captain wished to risk his men becoming tainted by the arch enemy's emanations rising from the doom world below. On the seventeenth day, the horde of cursed victims besieging the enforced of Pistrict headquarters battered down the final barricades, and the handful of still living black armored peacekeepers fell. Inquisitor Caius recorded the enforcer marshal's final words of the four Ordo Sleptim records. We will stand before the throne, and we will not flinch before his judgment, for we die doing our duty. The Inquisitor could hear the moistness of the man's lips in each word. The Marshal had been dying, coughing up mouthfuls of defeased blood. He finished with a strained, The Emperor protects. In truth, there had been more. But Cassius deleted the man's final oaths, cried in agony, and the wails of the plague victims in the room. Some stories didn't need to be told. With the blockade in place, there was talk of exterminatus, of bombarding the world from space in the name of the Emperor. Such discussion was quickly quenched. Orbital bombardment would not be sanctioned. The damage to the planet's precious aquaculture, as well as the loss of so many relics, would be the greatest sin. To use virus bombs would destroy all hope of resettlement for months to come, without guaranteeing a final death of the plague victims. To use cyclonic torpedoes would ravage the planet on a titanic level, blasphemy beyond belief. So Kyotha was allowed to die. Preparations were made on worlds elsewhere. In Scaria's sector, the talk of outbreaks, quarantines, and blockades became plans for invasion. Weeks passed before the preparations bore fruit, but for all of its slowness, the Imperial War Machine was a relentless beast. How did this happen? The question raged through the orbiting fleet and through the echelons in the Imperial rule that were even allowed to become aware of the situation. Nothing made sense. No response seemed without married flaws. The shrine world was precious beyond reckoning, yet had fallen without cause. Elsewhere, under the shadow of the War Master's new crusade, all worlds falling to the plague had been besieged, assaulted, or otherwise corrupted by mass presence of arch-enemy vessels. With Kaltha, there had been nothing but silence. At least... It was decided. Regiments of the Imperial Guard were withdrawn from greater war efforts around the Eye of Terror and assigned to the Vanguard the larger force of conquest. This blasphemy would not be tolerated. This desecration would not be allowed to stand. With the heavens above the Shrine World, a small fleet of hulking ships drew close, failing into the restful orbit. The blockade of the destroyed shattered to the warp. They scattered into the warp, leaving the ward in the care of these new arrivals, the troop ships of the Imperial Guard. One other vessel of note broke the warp space and glided into orbit along seas as monumental troop transports. A strike cruiser of the Adeptus Astartes, black as death in the night, bearing the marble covered sigil of the Raven Guard. The fleet drew close to the planet, casting colossal shadows, as the great ships blocked out the sun on the world below. The Kautha reclamation was underway. The Imperium of Man had come to take it back its holy world. Among the silent cathedrals and towering monarchies on the surface, the month's dead population sensed the presence of the Imperial service. They looked up, staring waiting. As the first troop transports came through the cloud cover, 
All over the planet a great cry was raised. The voices of fifty million dead men and women and children rose to the sky in a long and tortured chorus. The following regiments of His Most Glorious Majesty's Imperial Guard and Supporting Forces are committed to retaking the Shrine World of the Hatred Arch Enemy. Vindicin, 12th Rifles, 303rd Ura, 25th Caridian Irregulars, Janus, 6th, 3rd Shrekan Rangers, Caridus Rift, 4th Armored, Caridian 88th Mechanized Infantry, half a company of the Emperor's beloved Raven Goddess Stardis Chapter, and agents of His Divine Majesty's Holy Inquisition. Audio Sept Ulla Turion Reports from the Lord General Mareng sent directly to the Eagle and Bolter site that his imminent troop landings are complete with minimal casualties and all resistance to date utterly destroyed. The main force of the reclamation is due to arrive in several weeks. The 25th Korean Irregulars are to be commended for the vigilant defense last week of a visual communications tower in the capital city of Solothane. Kideons fought a heroic battle lasting several days, ultimately defeating the deceased dregs of Kothar Planetary Defense Force, the so-called Remnant. Assailing the position, casualties were light. The Janus VI was pressed deep into enemy held territory, securing a monastery dedicated to the Holy God Emperor. Even as we go to press, they crush all remnants of the PDF that seek to oust their successful beachhead in Solothane. The Cadian 88th Mechanized Infantry proudly boasting a captain bearing the Ward of Cadia Medal for his valor in the opening engagements of the 13th Black Crusade is tasked in the oncoming days to assist in the Gerdians' defiant infiltration. infiltration. The Emperor protects. Part 1. Curse of Unbelief. Chapter 1. Unbroken. We are the Cadian Shock. In their veins beats the blood of a thousand generations of the Imperial's most devoted guardians. We'll never again see blasphemy as black as that which we face on this world. Take solace in that, sons of the Emperor. After this war, no duty will ever seem as dark. Captain Fenrian Thade, first day of the Kotha Reclamation. Solothane, capital city of Kotha. The Janus VI is dead. Lydian sat at the Sentinel's creaking cockpit seat, monitoring the walker's primitive scanner displays, and staring out through the vision slits in the vessel's armored front. Several hundred meters in the distance through the buildings either side of the street, he saw the monastery building. A pillar of orange rage and black smoke choked the sky and he couldn't even report it to those who needed to know. As recon missions went, this one was looking to end pretty badly. Viltain looked at his Auspex display again, checking where the rest of his patrol group was. It looked fine. It felt like they were screwed, because Viltain was damn sure this night was going to end in bloodshed. Tactically speaking, his sentinel squadron were in perfect formation as they stalked and scouted the abandoned streets. Ahead, the colossal monastery still burned. The captain had warned about this. Damn it. He said that Janus Six was walking into their deaths. And now the Vox was bitching again. Nothing ever worked right in this damn planet. 
The city's silence amplified the rattling clank of his sentinel's ungainly stride. And that didn't exactly help Virian's hearing. But the comms being screwed to the eye and back were the main issue. Vox ghosts lost signals channels, slipping. Vox casters daunting. Heck. They've seen it all in Kotha so far. Incendency Walker C88 Primus Alpha. A voice came over the Vox again to a tone of agonizing calm. Repeat. Please. This was a problem. The only half reliable Vox channel Verton had been able to use the Calther's interference was a route back to the main headquarters. The main headquarters was three dozen kilometers away in the wrong direction. Help wasn't coming from there. And they weren't the ones that needed to be told about this development just yet. Even if they couldn't already tell from the orbital surveillance, other ears needed to hear it now. To make matters worse, they apparently had an idiot manning the forward recon channel tonight. So far, Verton had managed to relay his ID code, and that was about it. They'd been trying for five minutes, interference or not. You'd think they could have boosted the signal by now. I'll bet a year's pay this... B-Star, couldn't, isn't Cadian. This is Scout Lieutenant Ada Verton of the Cadian 88th. I'm leading the recon mission to access the progress of the Janus 6. Put me through to Captain Pyrrhian Thade. He spilled out the rough coordinates where the rest of the regiment was based in the city for the night. Repeat, please. Burton brought his walker to a halt and stood in the dead street, juddering as its engine idled. The spotlight beamed forward into nothingness, slicing into the dark alley between two silent buildings. This city was a tomb. In the name of the Emperor, the Janus Six is up to its neck in it. Give me a Vox link to my captain immediately. Consistency Walker C-88 Primus Alpha, your signal is weak. Repeat. Please. Verton swore and killed the link. I hate this planet. Control sticks gripped in gloved hands, Verton pushed forward and set the noisy sentinel clanking ahead in a slow stride of graceless machinery. A searchlight bolted to its cheek of the walker's pilot pot, tore left and right in the darkness, cutting a harsh white glare through the distorted streets. Abandoned buildings, bodies here and there, nothing but silence. Verton was unshaven, as if he'd spent so much time hiding within his sentinel's cockpit that he'd not had the opportunity to shave in a week. It wasn't too far from the truth. Verton to dead man's hand, acknowledge, signal. Four voices came back in turn as each member of the sentinel squadron voxed to their officer. No one was dead. That was something, at least. Form up in parallel streets and proceed to the main plaza ahead. Stalking pattern. Viridian thought. Tonight, with the Emperor's eyes, not his fist. Acknowledge pattern. Viridian. Came three of the four voices. Copy that. No heroics. Came the last one. The sentinels scattered in each within scanner range. Of all four others strode across the burning monastery. Occasional gunfire rang out as they annihilated small groups of plague slain, destroying the taint dead that clung to false life, revolving the streaks in packs. Splayed clawed feet of battered, blessed iron stomped on the smooth stone roads. Verton strode with a gentle stride, side-to-side -side motion of his sentinel's gait, as familiar to him as standing in his own boots. The capital city, Solothame, was built in worship of the Emperor and his great saint, Kautha. Its once purpose was to look beautiful. 
a purpose hundreds of planetary governors and ranking eschelarchs have been building on for thousands of years as new shrines, places of pilgrimage, monuments, and chapel habs were erected. All sense of original layout and centuries lost, burned and distorted in the ever-expanding mass of new construction. So let them now turn back, meter by meter, by the Imperial Guard as a labyrinth of winding and meandering streets, populated only by the abandoned traders, carts filled with cheap wares and false relics, deserted promenades were punic tainted by marble statues depicting Kalther and lesser saints and the nameless raven god heroes who originally served in the war to take the world 10,000 years ago in the great crusade shortcuts alleys twisted in the shadows of the towering chapel hab blocks all of which were encrusted with granite angels staring down at the dead city in his opinion, and as lead scout for the Cadian 88th, his opinion counted in every pleading way. He bothered to speak of it. Lurton believed the chapel habs were the worst aspect of the city's current state. The habitation towers dominated the skyline, thrusting up at random, wherever there had been space to house the vast numbers of pilgrims, forever moving through the city. Zolothain was beauty turned to ugliness in its rich accesses, and it gave enemy troops a million places to hide. The chapel habs now stood as great apartment spires, filled with the dead. No regiment wanted to draw the duty of cleansing those places. Seeking out agents of the arch enemy lurking among the plague slain, no one wanted to risk walking knee deep in bodies only for a plague slain to rise again. At Averton, the monastery burned, filling his viewing slit with orange warmth. His scanner choked and burst through static, but he can see the walls lining the edge of the holy site's grounds, rising up at the end of the street. His walker stomped closer, iron feet thudding into the stone road. No enemies were visible outside of the thirty-meter-high walls. But, at this range, Burton could hear the faint crack of countless las guns and the heavy chatter of bolt weapons. The Janus VI was fighting a losing war within the temple grounds. He clicked his vox link live and was about to try for the captain again when another voice crackled over. Sir, I've got something. The vox was hellishly distorted, even at close range so the other pilot's voice was garbled, rendering the speaker unintelligible. It took a glance at the scanner display to see Gear's placement, beacon flashing. He was three streets to the west, close to the front gate of the monastery's grounds. Specifics, Gear, said Verton. If I had specifics, I'd give them to you. My vox keeps daunting to another frequency. You told me Injun Callus fixed that two nights ago. Now is not the time for an instrument failure. The enemy could easily pick up stray vox on the interstellar frequencies. Gear's instruments had been the subject of repeated repairs since he had taken a rocket hit to the cockpit pod a year ago. Fighting heretics in the cities of Beshik V. 5. In the scorched and twisted metal that blackened his walker's cheek, was gone. But the missile's legacy remained. He did fix it. I'm saying it's shaken loose again. I'm hearing something. I'll pulse the frequency over. Listen for yourself. Send me the frequency. Can't... He... At... Get asked in a surge of vox crackle. Fitton turned his receiver and narrowed his eyes. In his headset, a whispering voice hissed at some three words in an endless monotone. Count the seven. 
Count the seven. Count the seven. I hear it. That's what they heard at Kaiser Patton, Gear said. Back when home first burned. Ferton nodded, feeling the word leave a bitter taste on his tongue. Kaiser Patton had been one of the first fortress cities to fall on Cadia. Only a handful of monos before our home was still burning. Damn it. They should be back there fighting for it, not wandering like rats in the city of the dead, half a sector away. Sir? I'm here. I'm here. He set his sentinel striding forward again, opening a channel to the whole squad. Vert into dead man's hand, change of plans. Everyone form up on my position immediately. Stay in visual range of one another from now on. Search pattern unity. Acknowledged. A chorus came back. Farrell, you head back to the captain. Cycle Vox channels as you run, alerting High Command as well as Captain Thane. This is not something the Lord General will learn from Orbital Picks, and he needs to be told immediately. What's the exact message, sir? Verdon told him what to say. The silence from the other pilots was deafening, as I digested a new revelation. After Farrell had Vox's acknowledgement and broken away, from the loose formation. Burton sat in the creaking leather seat, his pounding heart the loudest sound in the closest confines of his cockpit. The rest of C-88 Alpha closed around him, drawing alongside an orchestra of rattles and clanks. Each walker had played card painted on the cheek above the sentinel's pilot's name. Dead man's hand. The elite sentinel squadron of the Cadian 88th Mechanized infantry. We need visual confirmation on this. Prime weapons. Check your coolant feeds. The leader said. And follow me. Captain Femian Thade hadn't been home in three months, except in his nightmares. The reports from Cadia still listed over 60% of the planet in the hands of the arch enemy. But the numbers were almost meaningless. The statistics were cold and uncomfortable, but nowhere near as raw as a real as his memories. Those memories were played behind his eyes each night, over and over. He saw his world fall. The 13th Black Crusade for the first time in 10,000 years of defeat. A war master of chaos walked the soil of Cadia. The arch enemy finally had his first real victory, and the Cadians their first real defeat. The sky had burned for weeks, literally it burned. The fires of the fortresses, cities, choked the heavens from the horizon to horizon. Amongst the flames of burning cities, defense cannons roared into the sky. Defying the landing attempts of enemy troop ships. This was not some provisional world with a volunteer planetary defense force. This was Cadia. A warden world of only navigable path. From the Acurius Tiberius into the Imperium. The planet was second only to Holy Terra in its might and importance. Cathedral-like vessels of battlefeet, Sakaris ring the world, filling the night sky with their anger as they fired upon the Chaos fleet, pouring towards the enemy planet. Coming towards the planet, every city on the surface was a bastion of gun emplacements and void shield generators. Every citizen had trained to fire a LAS rifle from the preteen childhoods. The planet itself resisted the attack. By the time Kaiser Varak was lost to the flames of the invasion, the populace was already underground. Regiments of the Cadian Shock and the interior guard guided the fleeing citizens into the tunnels beneath the cities. 
engaged in fighting retreat as the legions of the arch enemy flooded into the tunnels in pursuit. It was these tunnels that they dreamed of. Each night, he heard his men shouting his name again, over and over. They needed orders. They needed ammunition. They needed to get out of the tunnels before the enemy destroyed the power reactors in the city above. Already the evacuation tunnels were shaking, raining dirt on the fleeing defenders. They were far from the evacuation carriers that would take them to another Kaiser. Thade had turned to hear the howling sounds of the pursuers. He still had both his hands. Two hands of flesh, blood and boned. As he barked orders. Orders for bayonets and blades and anyone out of ammunition. Those hands gunned his chainsword into life. He fired his bolt pistol last round in the bloodbath that erupted when the traitors spilled through Ka's surrendered walls two hours before. The disruption above had killed the lights in his section of the tunnel network. The only light now came from the narrow flashlights fixed to the sides of the soldiers' blast helms. Two dozen of those beams cut across the passageway at various angles as men looked this way and that, using this respite to identify comrades among the survivors. The tunnel shook again, showering grits and pebbles of concrete used to reinforce the passageways. A chunk of stone the size of a child's fist clacked off the captain's helmet. Similar debris rained on the others. Fluttering down several times a minute. As they waited in the darkness, This isn't the reactors, one soldier said. Too rhythmic, too loud. A titan, another man whispered. There's a titan up there. They nodded, sending his helmet torch cutting down and deep into blackness. His heart beat against his ribs in anticipation of the next tremor, which shook his bones when it finally came. On the surface above, a towering god machine strode unopposed through the burning city. Every soldier down in the darkness knew the odds were heavily against the titan being one of the Imperium's own. They're coming, sir, someone said in the near darkness. They'd faced the way his men had come. Hearing the enemy's cries getting closer. Men of Cadia! They chainsword roared into emphasis, the sound jagged and close enough to equal the earth-shaking footsteps of the gigantic war machine above. The great eye has opened, and hell itself is coming down that corridor. Stand. Fight. Every son and daughter of this world was born to slay the Emperor's foes. Our blood flows so humanity may draw breath. No blood more than precious. No blood more precious, the soldiers shouted as one. Come hearts and ice in your veins. They spoke softly in the lesser ramblings of the titan's wake. Rifles and blades were raised as wild, spasming shapes flashed into view, screaming down the tunnel. 88th! Fire! A chorus of cracks sounded. The last fire volley scythed down the first wave of shrieking heretics in front of Thade before they were even in full view. More around in the corner and running to where the tunnel widened. But blood of the Emperor. If it was just a handful of cultists down here, they might win this. And then he saw it. At the heart of the second wave, boots crunching corpses underfoot came death itself. Like a huntsman leading the pack of dogs. The foe 
that would take Thade's right hand, towered a meter and more above its lesser minions. Gibbering, howling, Cultus ran into the tunnel bearing bloody knives. The sawed slug pistols between them, walking with the distance eating stride, all the more terrifying for its slowness. As an immense figure in ancient armor of filthy bronze and cobalt blue, it moved like a dead thing, mindlessly treating to forwards, scanning left to right with a methodical patience. Its helm warped into the visage of an ancient Terran death mask from some long dead civilization. Emitted a chuckle. The laugh was a hollow, brittle sound that wheezed dust from the Akia archaeologic helmet speaker grid. In the figure's fist was a bolter of antiquated design, notched with a hundred centuries of wear and tear. The muzzle was coal black from countless firings on countless battlefields. Thade's men had been firing from the moment the enemy entered the tunnel. But while rare clad cultists died in droves, their armored overseer barely flinched at the hail of laser fire glancing from its carapace. It finished the scan of the room, citing the mortal shouting orders that was the one that had to die first. The traitor Astartes fired once as it advanced, purely pausing to aim, unleashing the shot that stole Thade's right arm from the elbow. The Kidian dropped his sword, clutched what remained of his arm, and hit the ground hard. Through the agony of his bolt firearm, he could still hear his men crying out, calling his name. Captain Thade. He awoke with a jolt as the dream broke. His adjacent Conan, his adjustant Conan, stood at the side of his cot. The other men's expressions were serious. These from the Sentinels. Thade sat up. His uniform was crumpled from a restless seep, and his body armor was neatly stacked on the ground by his bedroll. The 88th was camped for the night in the abandoned museum, sleeping fully amongst a thousand minor relics. Here, a golden figurine of the raven god Astartes, on a small marble pedestal shaped by a minor acolyte of Kotha many thousands of years before. They are a cabinet of trinkets, once worn by the finest Kotha's faithful. The relics did an impress Thade. A pilgrim trap, nothing more. Something to keep the visiting Deutries busy while they filled the planetary coffers. His head still ached from the day-long planning meeting with the Lord General earlier, and he left his thoughts clear. While he slipped from the standard-issue canteen by his pillow, the museum's air tasted of dust. Water didn't help much. The chemical compounds used to purify liquid rations left a coppery aftertaste on his tongue. Even knowing all the water was purified aboard the ships in orbit didn't help morale. The guard were fighting on a tomb world. The last thing they needed was water that tasted like blood. It was as if the death on Kotha touched everything that came to the planet, even after the plague had burned itself out. How long was I asleep? They'd asked, looking around the half-full chamber where thirty soldiers still slept on. Two hours, Conan said, knowing it had been the only two hours they had slept in the last fifty. Felt like two minutes. Life in the guard, eh? Sleep when you're dead. I hear that. They had stretched out, not altogether thrilled at the clicks in his back as he arched it. Cadian's was one thing, but 
Has anyone shot the Minotaur officer responsible for giving out these bed rules? Kron chuckled at the captain's banter. Not that I'm aware of. That's a crime. I may do it myself. Thade was already lancing his boots. Brief me now. What has dead man's hand found? It's just the trooper foul. Burton's taken the others closer to the monastery. Vox is down. Vox is down. Throne, I'm sick of that refrain. Fell returned with the message. They've cited primary threats, said Thade. Not a doubt in his mind. Few other reasons would be sh severe enough to split the Sentinel Squadron. They've intercepted dark box traffic that suggests primary threats close to their position. Yes. Listen to you, dancing around the issue. Corrin grinned. It was a grin Thade was very familiar with and usually preceded. Something cocky at best. Rash at worst. Didn't want to get your hopes up, sir. How decent of you. So what have they got? Please tell me it's more than intercepted Vox. Just the Vox. The file's got a recording, and it's... Well... Come take a listen to it. The captain buckled his helmet, pulling the chin strap tight, enabling the front of his medal... was a medal. The medal he won, he was known for. An eagle... Eagle-winged crate. A great way marked by a central skull glinting in the dim light of pre-dawn. Coming through the stained glass window, the ward of Cadia. Flashing silver on the blast helmet. Ready to stare into the eye itself, sir? Kron said. Thade smiled as he fastened the last buckle on his flak armor jacket and strapped on his weapon belt. A heavy caliber bolt pistol hung against his left hip. Against his right thigh rested an ornate chain sword. Its iron finish, polished to chrome brightness, with acid etched runes and stylized high gothic along the blade sides to say, a blade like that was worth a fortune, would be to underestimate. By no small degree. Lord General's weeded blades of poor quality. Is Rax ready? The captain asked, hope evident in his voice. No, sir, not yet. Ah, well, let's go see what dead man's hand has found. Chapter 2 Shrine Solothane Monastic Center Count to Seven The Vox recording crackled. The wards were broken by distortion, but clear enough to be sure. Captain Thade's squad of the Cadian 88th, the full 300 men and 30 support vehicles, moved out ten minutes later. The potential sighting of primary threats necessitated nothing less than a full response. Dawn wasn't far away, though even in the daylight, Solothane remained gray. The funeral pyres of weeks before still blanketed the sky with dark clouds that cover the re and that refused to dissipate, and the habitation spires were discolored by the smoke that until so recently, had choked the skies. With hulls of color, of iron and charcoal, a drabness that matched their surroundings. Chimera troop transports rumbled for abreast down city avenues, treads grinding precious mosaics into shards beneath the weight of the tanks. When the erratic city layout required drivers, 
divergent routes. The troop carriers navigated narrow streets and alleys in single file. The occasional sniper fire from PDF regiment forces was answered with squads deployed to sweep and cleanse buildings by the side of the road, and orders to catch up when they could. Vox contact was a joke, but Thade wasn't worried. He trusted his men to do their jobs and get back in line without a hitch. There were no strangers to urban warfare. No Cadian was. The convoy rode on towards a burning monastery, towards dead man's hand, and towards the primary class threats that might or might not actually exist. The atmosphere within each of the tanks was an unsmiling fix of professional readiness and a muted sense of grim anticipation. No one wanted to engage primary threats unless the odds were heavily stacked in Cadian's favor. But duty was duty, and the shock knew it was better they handled this than the other regiments garrisoned in Sullivan. The Janus 6 was a green unit. If they anticipated Vox traffic wasn't just twisted propaganda or Vox ghost, then they were already dead. The ambitious assignment to hold the monastery, the great shrine of the Emperor's unending majesty, was just almost as soon as it had begun. They had focused, rolling his shoulders in matte black flak armor and checking his chainsword for the eighth or ninth time. It was almost an hour since he had woken. The last vigises of the memory dream were finally fading from his mind. He hated to remember Cadia. Remembering home led his thoughts into how he and his men should be back there even now. Into the eye with his upstart bastard Lord General that demanded Cadian units to be withdrawn from the front lines of the De Boilers Crusade to help with this little shrine world reclamation. The familiar rattling of the armored personnel carrier soothed his thoughts. His right hand gloved in black, word with soft mechanical purrs as he closed his fingers into a fist. He felt the rough mechanics of his augmented wrist and knuckle joints rotating, hearing the low buzzing clicks between the infrequent metallic judders of the Chimera's interior. Captain, the driver called. They had rose from his seat in the passenger compartment and moved to lean on the driver's seat from behind. Through the wide vision slit, the soot blackened marble of Kothos, largest cathedral district, was visible. This was the heart of Solothane, and all its fire touched majesty. What a cesspit, the driver said. It was Koron, as always, driving Thade's command chimera. You're quite the poet, said the captain. Now talk to me. Two minutes, sir. We... Wait. Hang on. We've got a roadblock. The compartment shuddered as if kicked by Titan, generating a roar of complaints from the ten soldiers strapped into their seats into the back. They had mechanical hands snapped vice tight on the handrail, keeping his balance. Roadblock cleared. The driver grinned. Go around the next one, Koran. They tried not to imagine what that roadblock had just been. You said two minutes. Confirm, sir. Just another two minutes until we come up on where dead man's hand have withdrawn. These streets are a bit... Shh. Not exactly made for tanks. Pilgrim roads, I hear you. They'd narrowed his violet eyes and stared out into the vision slit. The limb-listed vista on display raced past in a blur of blackened buildings. I can't see a dang thing out there. 
and a third class threat so far. Constantly, sir. Again, with a trademark grin. What do you think that last roadblock was? Delightful. You're plowing down plague victims now. What happened to respecting the dead? They're not exactly respecting us. The generator cuckle chuckles from the soldiers in the rear. Point, they conceded. But you know where the orders came from. These people were imperial citizens. Koran. Pilgrims. Priest. I heard the stories. They were faithless. Only the faithless will fall to this plague. Isn't that what we've been told a thousand times? They dropped it. He didn't want to derage this up again, because he found it hard to argue with his driver tonight. He believed, as Koran did, the faithless had fallen. They deserved this fate. To hell with the mandate for clean kills at all times, and preserving the plague slain to be redeemed in the consecrated insurrections. But Kutha Reclamation Protocol stressed respect for the victims of the curse of unbelief. The Lord General was keen to foster political allies within the ecclesiarchy by retaking this world as cleanly and carefully as possible. The emphasis on respecting the tainted dead was one more pretty, petty protocol in the long list that they'd hated to think about since he made Planetfall. Destroying the dead wasn't enough. They had to be put down with grace. Gathered by guardsmen with a hundred better things to do. And ritually burn in the receptate funerary cremation facilities. By the Emperor's grace, the 88th hadn't been selected for gathering deities yet. Killing those that refused to die was bad enough. Drive they'd said. And don't argue. Besides, if the engine seer Orosian finds out you've been using my command chimera to ram gangs of plague victims clogging the road, you'll have your head. It's an insult to the machine spirit, after all. Go on grinning like you just won a month's wages. Wrench the street's steering wheel to the left. Another three souls in the ruined rigs our Catherine pilgrims met their final end under the churning tracks of the ranging troop transport. There was a brief wrenching of the gears as something, some part, of one of the plague victims got caught up in the APC's moving parts. They closed his eyes for a moment. I never want to hear that again. It was a purr. You're good, Coron. But you're not irreplaceable. It would give me, it would grieve me to see you shot for disrespect. Play safe this time, by the book. And no hacking off the machine spirit. Not at all. The driver licked his lips. The old girl likes it rough. When I say ramming speed, then you get to play your game. Understood, sir. The aide's vox bead pulsed in his ear. The captain tapped the earpiece, activating the fingernail-sized receiver strapped to his throat. As he spoke, it picked up the vibrations of his larynx and filtered out background noise. Captain Thade, Caden 88th. Count the seven. Someone hissed. Even though the vox distortion, the voice was wet and bubbling. Count the seven. They'd cut the link. New orders. <sighs> Just vox ghost. They turned to the ten soldiers in the back. Each one watched them, quiet, attentive, at the ready. Jandon, 
He nodded to his Vox operator. Change command frequency and share the new wavelength with the other squads. The current one has, um, compromised. He saw the question in Jade's eyes, but... Jaden's eyes, but gave no answer. The Vox officer leaned down to where his bulky backpack was secured by his seat and made the necessary adjustments to his communication gear. Done, sir. They'd gripped the handrail running the length of the ceiling, supporting himself against the shakes. Get me dead man's hand. Patch Verton through to my earpiece. You're live. Verton, this is Captain. Acknowledge. They'd listen to the reply and narrowed his eyes. Thirty seconds, Verton. That's all. He switched the command channel. 88th at the ready. Disembark in 30 seconds. The plaza ahead is flooded with plague slain and dead man's hand needs exa- extraction. We go in, we kill everything not wearing our clothes, and we move on to the monastery Koron. Sir? He was already grinning. Ramming speed. The auto cannon roared. Fall back! Vutton cried, wrenching his control sticks. His walker reversed, the backwards jointed legs, positioning with a hiss of angry pistons. Solid rounds pinged and clanged from the pod's slopped armor. While the sentinel's underslung cannon replied in a persuasive blast of thunderclap after thunderclap. The plaza had erupted in gunfire a few minutes before an expanse of concrete inhaled with the mosaics of the saint formed a courtyard between several towering temples. The squadron had been scouting here when the first sniper shot rang out. Within a minute, plague slain was shambling from the temples. Led by cultists wearing ragged remains of Cothernite PDF uniforms. They came in a tide, ultimately broken in places as the sentinels opened up with the auto guns, drowning out the grunts and the wails of the dead. We are not dying here! Vutton smoke into his vox link. Break formation and fall back! He never heard an acknowledgement from the others. He could barely hear his own voice over the carnage unfolding around his walker. The squadron wasn't going to win the straight-up fight. They all knew it. They were scouts, and the sentinels were armed for taking shots at armored infantry and light tanks. The high-caliber rounds from the walkers' autocannons were tearing holes in the crowds of plague slain, but they were next to useless against such a horde. Gears walker staggered, almost thrown from balance, as its stabilizer strained to deal with the striding over piles of moving corpses. In a move worthy of a medal, Verton saw the other pilot condense his leg pistons, lowering his cockpit pod for a moment, then sprung upwards to clear the mound of writhing dead he'd been standing on top of. Gear landed with such a thudding clink that shook the ground, turning as he walked backwards and opening fire on the plague slain again. The swarm of corpses dressed as monks flew apart in grey-red cloud as three autocannon rounds hit home. That was beautiful, said Vutton, through clenched teeth as he kept laying down fire. I look forward to my promotion, crackled Gear. Vutton joined the fire arc to Gears and fell to Sentinel's gate, start to drag. <laughs> he was limping now limping badly. You got three of them on your right leg, sir. Gear kicked. Kick them free. Burton tried. His sentinel replied by lurching violently to the right with such a screech of positioning stabilizers. Alarms flashed against his console as his leg piston vented air pressure. They ruined my stabilizers. I'm not kicking anything for a while. As he spoke, Vutton's cockpit tilted again. His helmeted head smacked against the side of his pod, the pain painting his vision in a palette of greys. The dead were clambering his walker now. 
He heard their fists beating on the armor plating on his cockpit. They might even drag him down if enough of them could scramble up. His walk sparked a life with a burst of static. Vern, this is Captain. Emperor's blood. As a voice was clear, he sounded close. Acknowledge. The stick on his breath and half blind through a concussion, Vern reported the situation, ending with four words Captain Thade had been praying not to hear. Dead man's hand, broken. Thirty seconds, Vernon, that's all. It turned out to be just under twenty seconds. The chimeras tore into the plaza, a rolling thunderid. Thunderhead that slammed into the horde of wailing dead, black as a panther. The command chimera pounded into the first group, grinding them into bloody goblets. It swerved to a halt, cutting down the plague slain nearby with angry beams of light from its multi-laser turret. An irritated whine of high energy las fire shrilled above the moans and crunches of combat. The other chimeras, their hulls a gunmetal gray, followed in the wake of destruction. Dozer blades bolted to the front of the troop transports, specifically banned from ungentle use in clearing roads of corpses, now hammered the plague slain to the ground and crushed under heavy treads. The drivers spread out to form a protective ring around the embattled walkers' turret fire, slicing through the bodies of anyone approaching the tanks in a chorus of clangs. Thirty rear ramps slammed down into the mosaic ground, and the ADA spilled from their transports. Guns up and firing red flashes. Thade was first out of his chimera, chainsword raised and howling. Secure the walkers! For the Emperor! The captain's voice, first foe, wasn't dead. A PDF trader ran at him, slowed by the diseased ravaged body. And his fat was a broken bayonet. They chained sort of sang in a savage backhand swing, and the traitor's head left his shoulders. First blood, Tacadia! Someone shouted to his left. The fight lasted less than two minutes. Last guns cracked out, headshots and orderly volleys, scything down the enemy in waves. The Cadians stayed shoulder to shoulder in their squads, taking no casualties in the brief battle. When the last of the plague slain was dragged from the leg of Verton's walker and shot in the back of the head, they had holstered pistol. Sergeants from all fifteen squads ringed him, every man standing ankle deep in dead. The stench rising around was enough for several men to don the rebreather mask. At eighth status, unbroken. Fifteen squad leaders chorused, unbroken. Verton sat in his cockpit. The door opened so he could speak freely. He made the sign of the Aquila. Close call, though. They nodded. We move to take, to retake the shrine of the Emperor's undying majesty. We're hearing nothing from the Janus Six in there. If they have any survivors left, they're almost certainly retreating deeper into the monastery. Every eye turned to the building a kilometer away. Through the winding streets, half of it still burned. We're going in. Securing it where the Janizans have failed. And waiting to be reinforced. If the resistance is beyond our capabilities... Then we get comfortable and ask Reclamation Command what they want us to do. Questions? Primary threats? Asked one of the sergeants. Potentially nothing solid yet. If we find them, we take them down. If there are too many, we consolidate and wait reinforcements. Verton, report. The Sentinel pilot cleared his throat. <clears> throat> we pulled back into the plaza 
when the fighting in the temple grounds abated. We were looking for a staging ground, sir. The last we saw at the monastery, the enemy's rear guard was following the forward elements in. The main doors were breached. Six, maybe seven hundred remnant, he said, referring to Catherine PDF traders. Double the number of plague slain. Seven hundred secondary class threats and fifteen hundred third class, the captain confirmed. Nothing changes. We split into three forces, each with specific objectives. I'll take the one hundred men to the central chambers. Lieutenant Horan, you take a hundred to the undercroft and make sure there's no way into the shrine from underground. Lieutenant Derek, you get the bell towers. Question? No one spoke. The Emperor protects, said Thane. Now move. Resistance was nowhere to be seen. Gaining access to the monastery provide, proved uncomfortably easy. The towering gates were broken, torn from their hinges, and there was a little sign of enemy forces around the expensive courtyard. These ended their pathetic existences under precision last fire. As the guardsmen filled their chimeras and moved in squads up the wide marble stairway to the front entrance, the air reeked of the dead, and the burning sections of the monastery itself, the potent musk that had gained inspired a lot of breather use. Minutes became hours, deep within the labyrinthine monastery, the shrine of the emperor's unending un majesty. Almost three hundred soldiers of the Cadian 88th were on the hunt. Bodies of plague victims littered the stone floor, just as they did in each passage. The chamber the Cadians had passed through in the last few hours, the Janizans hadn't just been besieged, they'd been infiltrated and annihilated. Bodies of the regiment, blood-soaked their urban camouflage gear, were strewn everywhere in the monastery alongside the enemy dead. Their last stand had been inglorious and, to Cadian's eyes, rather impressive. Unimpressive. The Genesis 6 was scattered and poor defensive, spread across the monastery series of awe-inspiring sermon chambers. The final resting places showing to the trained glance of the 88th just which soldiers, soldiers had been f dead, had died fighting, and which ones had broken ranks to seek an escape. No sign of primary threat so far, in fact. They and his officers had just about abandoned the notion of seeking any first-class targets. They had real problems now. Enough territory threats to last a lifetime. The plague slain were everywhere, inside the monastery, and in far greater numbers than those by dead man's hand outside. Room by room, the guardsmen cleansed the holy site, cutting down and shrieking dead as they staggered in feral mindlessness. Nothing but shells of unfocused menace. Poisonous blood showered Captain Stade as he impaled a howling woman with a thrust of his chainsword. A hundred whirling teeth sawed through fleshy resistance, and the woman cried blasphemies as she was disemboweled. It was hard to tell the dead ones from those that still lived. Neither would lie down and die when you wanted them to. They all made the same noises. They yanked hard, freeing the blade from her torso and her light spray of near black blood and fragments of flesh that smelled beyond foul. The rot taking hold of the enemy made such work all the easier. Decay softened the flesh, making it weak. Under Imperial Last Fire, the vulnerable and the howling bite of chainswords. The corpse began to rise again, ponderously clambering to its feet despite being gutted and missing an arm. 
They had blades sliced as he killed the power. He'd been fighting with the weapon for almost half an hour, and his muscles burned with effort, exhausted to his core. He pulled his bolt pistol and pressed the muzzle against the woman's broken skull. The air within the monastery was cold, but he blinked stinging sweat from his eyes. In the name of the Emperor, just die. The bolt shell hammered into the corpse's head and exploded within the brain, worrying the Imperial Guardsman captain with more chunks of decaying matter. A flying shard of skull hit his breastplate with enough force to leave a scratch. The sharp cracks of Laz fire course died down around him, and Thade's command squad disappeared around a barely decorated contemplation chamber. Each of the nine fighters scattered, but stayed in eye contact with one another. Member of the squad. Every man wore dark gray fatigues and black chest armor, made filthy from the day's fighting. I need a vox, they'd called out across the Kernetivus sermon chamber. Jaden moved over to him, jogging around the dip in the floor where a mosaic of the emperor had been defiled some weeks ago. The room reeked of urine and vast amounts of blood used to deface the image. Jaden's hardened Thade, his speech horn connected to the bulky Vox scanner on his back. Your life, Captain. Squad Ventner to our lines. Acknowledge signal and give me situation report. The pause of several seconds put Thade's nerves on edge. There's a million ways this mission can go wrong. Even with the greatest trust in his men, he hated his squad scattered in the hive of the dead. Lions here, Captain. Situation unbroken. We're close to the chorus chambers atop the northern bell tower. We need ten, fifteen more minutes to get to the place. Acknowledged. Dean replied and nodded to Jaden. Squad veterinary to fortitude. An amendment report. The pause this time lasted longer. Jaden shook his head in the captain's glance. It wasn't an interference for once. Advent here, Captain. Situation unbroken. We're entering the Undercroft now. This is fortitude. Unbroken. Moving with a madman to support. Heavy resistance in the keller delayed us. We found where the remnant was regrouping. And they're not regrouping anymore, sir. Forty minutes of mission objective. Understood. Be careful, said Thade. So they went. Squad Phalanx next, then Endurance, and then Defiance. And so on, and down the line. The captain listened to the brief situation reports of each of his fifteen squads. Casualties were light, despite the fighting being fierce. They had led his one hundred men in a loose scattering of squads we would take control of the primary altar chambers at the heart of the monastery. Another hundred followed. First, Lieutenant Huron to secure the undercroft of Purge, the subterranean tombs of the enemy. Second, Lieutenant Derek led the last hundred, securing the four bell towers thrusting up from the monastery's central domes. The holy building was the size of a small town, the 88th had spent the best part of three hours cutting right to its core. One last Vox report to make. The most important one. This is Captain Thade, 88. Reports progress as expected. Resistance medium, no heavy. No sign of primary threats. Repeat, zero sightings on primary threat. Resistance so far, secondary threats, 20%. Triciary threats, 80%. A simple message was all that required. He doubted they even reached the Lord General's base, but it still had to be done. Jaden took the speech horn when they had handed it back. Only 20% on the secondary threat? Felt like more. 
They'd smiled at the Voxcaster with a bandage arm. I bet he did. At his order, the squad moved out, heading deeper into the monastery. The chambers grew larger, expanding into halls, each one majestic in size and increasingly grand in orientation. Built by faithful hands many thousands of years ago, arched walls and ceilings were supported by great spines of stone. Thickly jutting from the skeletal agriculture, stylized piles rose to the roof, each one bathed in a weak dusk light coming through the shattered stained glass windows. The ten soldiers in Thade's squad fanned out, stalking through the rear near darkness in a familiar ritual stops and starts. Run to a pillar. Crouch. Rifle up the scan ahead. Run to the next pillar. Something cried out ahead. It was either inhuman or hadn't been alive in weeks. They'd look around. The pillar... He was kneeling behind, one hand on a faded red carpet. For balance, he saw nothing, but heard the moan again. A few dozen meters ahead of him, the sight blocked the piles. A las gun fired with a single sharp crack. Contact! Someone called out. Tracer, any threat confirmed? The Cadians advance, rifles up, and no need to hide. A small group of plague victims, no more than twenty, spilled sluggishly from the arch behind the torn red curtain. They'd squeezed off a shot with his bolt pistol, detonating the head of the lead, cursed victim. Kill them! he shouted, and nine las guns lit the chamber, and with flickering red flashes of pinpoint las fire, not a single shot missed. But the diseased, that corpses still took several direct hits to be put down for good. The soldier stood around the bodies after killing was done. It was Kotha reclamation pr protocol to speak short prayers for each of the fallen when time allowed. Captain Thayer ordered his men on without a word. Time was not on their side. The squad moved through the series of smaller chambers, each one a mosaic-rich tribute to St. Cother's deeds, paid for by hundreds of generations of pilgrims. Progress was fast until the squad's eleventh men wheezing as he leaned down on an aquila-toppled black staff, grasped the captain's name. They had halted. Make this good, Seth. I hear someone calling, crying out, as if it's from a great distance. The Satan Sector wiped a fleek, a foamy spittle from his lips with a trembling hand. His powers were erratic at best of times, waxing and wanting without his control. This campaign was a nightmare. Kutha was rich, thick, and warped disruption and the psychic toll on the Imperial Guard's telepaths was immense. Five had died of embolisms in the weeks since Planetfall, one of heart rupture, and a further two had fallen under possession by nameless horrors born of the warp. Calling out to us? Thane asked. I could not tell. There was something I hid. Here Seth paused to suck air through his teeth. Something powerful. Something old. Primary threat. Asked As this was greeted by a short wave of chuckles from the gathered soldiers, and they'd shake in his head. Not likely, he said. The captain resisted the urge to sneer at the wheezing, thin-limbed psyker. Their eyes met and the gaze held for several moments. The captain's eyes were typical pale violent of the Cadian bone, while Seth's were deep blue. Bloodshot under the band of metal across his brow that sank cables into his brain to amplify his unreliable talents. Anything more specific? 
and try to keep his the dislike out of his voice and his expression. He was almost successful. An ancient of the arch enemy. In the next chamber. In one of the chambers ahead. I cannot be sure. The warp clouds everything. They nodded, inclining his head and leading the squad on. Jendon, what chambers are ahead? The Vox officer consulted his data slate, tapping a few buttons. A series of purification halls. Pilgrims used them to bathe before being allowed to enter into the inner temple. A bathhouse in a cathedral. Zaylin, the squad's weapon specialist, walked alongside Jandon, and the hum of his life's plasma gun set the troopers' teeth on edge. They had felt his scalp prickling, but fought it down, the sensation as he spoke. It was Thade who answered. Saint Kotha, Emperor Rest His Bones, was framed for his piety. It makes sense those who came to see his remains would be required to retrofit clean themselves. Zelen shrugged and looked away. A bit of his, a habit of his, but he didn't have words to answer. Ahead of them, the great double doors leading into the purification chambers stood closed. They filed engravings of female angels, carved of marble, now stained with blood and bloody matter. Stared down the eleven men. They had cleared his vote. Throat. Trooper Zellin? Yes, sir. Open the doors. Yes, sir. Zellin raised his plasma gun and squeezed the first trigger. The baseline hum of arcane weapon intensified the angry whine of massing energy. He breathed the quiet knock knock and pressed the second trigger. The plasma gun roared. All right, that should do it. The first two chapters of Cadian Blood finished. I'll be doing another audiobook like this as well. More stories to come in the future my dear followers. Let me know what you think in the comments below of this story so far. I seem to be, well, enjoying it. I like to imagine that this takes place after Katie has fallen, which is why the main character wants to be back home. He wants to be in something that he remembers. Something that has meaning in his life. But since it's gone now, due to most recent events, it's just gone. So anytime they mention anything that's out of the ordinary, such as Katie is still standing, I'll just imagine that I didn't read it. And instead it said, Katie has fallen. Or something like that. Anyways. I have been Summon Pale Fist of Dawn, otherwise known as Isaiah. First name drop right there. Sorry about that. Wishing each and every one of my beautiful listeners, wonderful as you are, a great day. And remember to stay safe in these troubling times, for you do not wish to be one of the unfaithful and fall to the curse. So long, and we will meet again in another video. So long, for now.